Good evening, everyone. If everyone can take a seat, we're going to get started tonight. It's good to see everyone tonight, and if you're visiting, I'm Pastor Dave, and uh, we want to welcome you to Momentum Christian Church, and uh, would like to invite you out also Sunday at 10 o'clock to celebrate with us. But if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. In discipleship class this week on Monday night, we had a great time together. And it was the next morning this verse came up as we were sharing what God was putting on our hearts. And in 1 Peter chapter 2.24, it says this, He who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you've been healed for you are strained like sheep but you've now been returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls and we hear that verse a lot in fact it was a prophecy that came to pass in Isaiah 53 and I was thinking about this especially from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock today exactly what Christ did for us. It says this, He bore our sins. He gave us a gift. He gave us life. And it says this, by His stripes we've been healed. And see, that healing is the idea that we're never going to die. Oh, this physical body is going to fail. But he's given us eternal life. And you know, and someday we're going to have a glorified body with no more pain. I've been having some back pain. And even coming here today and getting out of the car, it was just acting up again. And the thought came through me, one day I'm going to get a new body. See, a lot of times when you hear the scripture read, they, it's read almost like our physical healing today. But listen, it's not. It's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about us We've been given a spirit. You guys hear me often say this, a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's our heart, our soul that's so messed up. But the good news is, is Jesus hung, hung on a cross that we might have life. So listen, I'm going to ask you to stand tonight. And tonight we're going to remember what Jesus Christ did. We're going to honor him. And I really want you to pay attention to the song lyrics tonight. Sometimes we can just sing the song, especially if we know it, and not really pay attention to the lyrics. I'm a lyrics guy. You can, I can hear any song, and what I'm hearing is the words that are being sung. So I'm going to ask you tonight, concentrate on those words as the worship team leads us. And then when Jeff comes up to share the message tonight, Hear what God is putting on his heart. And listen, receive it. Again, I've seen something today that said this, the worst day and the best day happened within three days. We know the story, though. Put yourself tonight in the shoes of the disciples and the followers of Christ. I thought about that earlier today. They were men on the run. They thought it was over. They were scared. Everything they'd known for the last three years was they thought was gone. So listen, let's honor Jesus Christ tonight.
Let's give him praise and honor for what he did for us, taking our sins, taking our place. And when he said, it is finished, the beautiful thing is it means this, paid in full. Paid in full. Lord Jesus, we come before you tonight. And Lord, I thank you. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for us. Lord, you paid a debt that I could not pay. God, you died on a tree that I might have life and life more abundant. And Lord, tonight, Lord, as we come and we honor you and we remember what you did for us, Lord, cause us to worship you. That's what our main focus needs to be daily, is to glorify you. That's why we were created. It's not about us. It's not about us, but it's about you. So, Lord, again, I just thank you. I praise you, Lord, for giving us life tonight. I praise you for setting us free, for breaking chains. I thank you for dying on that cross for every sin I've committed and every sin I'm going to commit. I thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of repentance, the gift of conviction. And I thank you, Lord, that you're such a loving Father that you gave your one and only Son. So, Lord, I just pray tonight, Lord, as we reflect, as we remember, Lord, I pray that you're honored. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said,
Father, we thank you so much for the blood that you shed for us, Lord Jesus. Father, when that blood and that water hit the ground, all of our sins were washed away with it. Father, you are forever the hope in our heart. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would be with each and every one of us tonight as we worship you, Lord. We lift this service to you, Jesus. In your justice and your mercy And walk the broken This sinner's battle
shameful sin placed on him the hope of every man oh the blood of Jesus washes me oh the blood of Jesus shed for me what a sometimes when we're doing hymns they feel kind of old but um, maybe 
Maybe it's because they, they're so simple. They really, they really get down to the core of what it is that they're trying to say. Maybe you're here because you're a member, you come here all the time. Maybe this is your first time here. Maybe this is your first time in a church. There's one thing that you need to know. And as a Christian, the one thing that we need to be constantly reminded of, there's nothing that we can do on this earth that are gonna, that's going to get us into heaven. There's no amount of money that you can give. There's no amount of nice things you can do for people. It's not going to get you there. Only one thing. And that's what Christ did on the cross. That's what we're celebrating tonight. It can seem kind of morbid. You know, Sunday's kind of a celebration day. Friday's, you know, this is the day that Jesus was tortured, hung on a cross. That's the symbol of our religion a torture device but there's a reason for that it's supposed to be a reminder it's supposed to be a reminder for all the things that we've ever done Those were all that stuff was paid for on the cross but you gotta believe it's not just about knowing you gotta believe it you gotta trust in God. You gotta let Him in your heart. Let Him in your life. Let Him change your life. Because there's nothing that that's gonna wash away your sin but that. That's what this this song is about. So dwell on that. Meditate on that.
Amen. You know, as Chris was leading us in that song, and what he was saying earlier is so true. Isaiah says this, that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And I, I think about that daily. My best is no good. It's only Christ in me and through me can do anything that's lasting. So listen, let's just take a moment here. And maybe you've been finding yourself operating in your best. I don't know about you, but I fight that fight a lot. So many times we can lose focus. And it's just a time like this that God starts working in our hearts and just causes us to refocus on what is important, but also giving us the understanding without Him we can do nothing. Lord, we come to you right now and we thank you for the blood. It is definitely nothing but the blood of Jesus that has set us free, that has made us clean. Again, I thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross that I might be justified before the Father. Jesus, cause us to realize that it's only through you, Lord, that we can do your Father's will, our Father's will. So God, I ask right now, Lord, that you just cause us, Lord, to settle this. If it's us, Lord, if we've been doing things in our own strength, God, we lay that down right now. And we say, you take over. So, Lord, I just thank you again for who you are. I thank you for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. And I just ask, Lord, that you just cause us, Lord, now to have hearts that will hear, soft hearts that will receive. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, tonight we have an opportunity. Um, uh, to hear Jeff Trott, for you guys that are visiting tonight, Jeff Trott is one of our teaching elders here at the church, and um, he does a great job, and I'm looking forward to what God has given Jeff tonight to speak. We tried to get one of these to everybody as you were coming in. Is there anybody that doesn't have one of the uh, outlines? Everybody covered? We're in good shape? Okay, very good. I have to tell you, I am excited about sharing this message tonight. I've been working on it for a couple of weeks anyways, and it's just, as I was doing the last preparations today and so on, it just excites me to have this opportunity to come and share this with you tonight. Uh, tonight, we are going to examine the most significant event in all of human history, Jesus' death on the cross. Almost all of history prior to the cross pointed toward it. You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, just after Adam and Eve sinned. God had said, pointed to the future when Satan would bruise Jesus' heel. And all of history since then has looked back to it. So significant was Jesus' life and death that mankind centered history's calendar around his earthly ministry. It's where we get our B.C. and our A.D. B.C., of course, is before Christ. A.D., in the year of our Lord. Someone has written, the cross is not the end of the story, it's the theme of the story. Jesus himself said of himself in Mark 10, 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The cross is why Jesus came. He's the only person that has ever lived who was born to die. Now, admittedly, this is an uncomfortable subject, and it should be. We don't have to experience God's wrath, but only because Christ did on our behalf for our sin. We're the ones responsible for nailing him to the cross. We should feel discomfort. 
because of our familiarity with the general idea of Jesus' crucifixion and the frequency with which we refer to it, we may tend to skip over the gory details in our minds and fail to realize the depth of his suffering. But as painful as it is to look at those details, we need to be reminded of the cost of sin. My prayer tonight is that we would all leave here with a deeper understanding of what Jesus went through for us so that when we worship him, when we pray to him, when we commune with him in his supper, we would always approach him with an appropriate attitude and proper reverence. Now we could take months and still not fully cover all of the events involved around Good Friday. So obviously we can't cover everything tonight. But with the limited time that we have available to us, I'll at least try to cover most of the major details surrounding the cross and what Jesus endured. And we're going to do that by letting the Gospels tell this story. This video age that we are now living in shortens our attention spans. Our televisions, our movies, our videos, all of those are designed in a way to keep our attention and they're all built around 1.6 second different changes in the camera angles to keep us tuned in. But I'm going to ask you to fight and stay focused on God's word tonight. I'm going to ask you to stay with me. It will be worthwhile. If you do stay with me, everyone here can leave tonight with a better appreciation for what Jesus went through and what it was he did for us on the cross. Now, before we get into it, let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we would ask for your blessing upon this time tonight. We would ask that as we dig into your scriptures, as we see the picture that you have painted for us in what it is your son went through and just how badly he suffered, that you would speak to us and give us an appreciation, a fuller and deeper appreciation for all that he's done for us. Help us, Father, to understand what it is that we're presented with tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, allow me to set the scene, if you would, and to summarize the hours leading up to the cross before we actually get into that part of the, uh, the story. The year is 30 or perhaps 30 A.D. I lean toward 30. I think that's a better, a better timing. It takes place, of course, just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And what we have to understand as we go through this story is that Jerusalem is filled with people and it's bristling with activity. It's a festive atmosphere. It is the Passover season that is upon the Jewish nation. And every male 12 years and older who was able to get there was supposed to come and celebrate it in Jerusalem. And when you could, you brought your family with them. Passover consisted of the Passover feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of first fruits, all of them built together in that eight-day period. The streets were crowded with people. Everywhere you went, there were crowds. It was just elbow to elbow and shoulder to shoulder. As Pastor Dave referenced on Sunday morning, I think it's Josephus that had indicated it's something like 2 or 2.5 million people would crowd themselves into Jerusalem for the feast. And Jerusalem is not that big of a city. It's more like, a, in our day, more of a large town kind of thing is what it is. So it's packed with people. There's extra soldiers on hand because the Romans wanted to make sure they kept the peace at this time. It was a cauldron of different people with different agendas all gathered in one place. It was noisy. There was busyness going on all around. People making preparations for the upcoming feasts that they were going to celebrate. Emotions ran very high at this time in Jerusalem. And above all of that, it was the time of the year that the Jewish nation expected Messiah to make his appearance. So all of that is behind us here. We're at the end of Jesus' earthly life. He's 33, 34 years old, something like that. We're at the end of his three and a half year long earthly ministry. Throughout his time so far, on various occasions, he had said, my time has not yet come. A time is coming in the future. A time is coming. But now... It is his time. That time is now here. Keep in mind as we go through this, Jesus is fully human. 
for probably much, if not most of his life, this cross death was hanging over him. Jesus knew that this day would one day come and that the cross was waiting for him. And now here it is. The church refers to this week as Passion Week, which begins on Palm Sunday and culminates on Resurrection Sunday or Easter. The days and nights leading up to Good Friday have been very busy, emotional, and exhausting times for Jesus. On Palm Sunday, which was actually Lamb Selection Day for the upcoming Passover celebration, Jesus, God's Passover Lamb, entered the city of Jerusalem riding on a donkey and fulfilling the ancient prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, publicly presenting himself to the nation of Israel as their promised Messiah, only to see the people receive him as a political savior, which they hoped would save them from their Roman oppressors. This caused Jesus to wail loudly over his people because they had missed him for who he really was. And don't ever think God is not in charge of history because the book of Daniel predicted to the exact day when Messiah would show up and present himself to Israel. God is in control of all of this. On Monday of Passion Week, he cleared the temple for probably a second time. On a very emotional Thursday evening, Jesus celebrated the Passover feast with his disciples, which was his last meal with them before his death. During this celebration, he was betrayed by a close friend. He had to rebuke his disciples. He transformed the Passover feast into what we celebrate as the Lord's Supper or Communion and gave his disciples their final instructions before he was to die on the cross the following afternoon. Later that evening, he led his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, where his mental and emotional anguish and pain were so severe as to cause him to sweat great drops of blood. His disciples couldn't even stay awake with him to provide any kind of comfort or support. Shortly after this, he was arrested, arrested and endured two separate quote-unquote trials a three-part religious trial led by the Jewish leaders and a three-part secular trial led by Pontius Pilate and Herod Antipas for the Roman government. These trials lasted throughout the night and into the, into the following morning. They were blatantly unfair and for the most part, illegal. Charges were trumped up. False accusations were made and false witnesses were brought forth. But even with all the conniving, they were unable to find him guilty of anything. Throughout the course of these trials, Jesus endured tremendous physical and psychological abuse beyond what I am convinced none of us here whose bodies have been exposed to the effects of and weakened by mankind's inherited sin nature could survive. In these hours leading up to the actual crucifixion, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was slapped, punched repeatedly in the face, ridiculed, insulted, stripped naked, and spit upon. They mocked his kingship by mashing a crown of long, sharp thorns onto his head and forcing him to wear a faded purple robe and to hold a staff in his right hand as a mock scepter, which they then in turn took and used to beat him on the head over and over again and over again, driving the thorns deeper into his bleeding, tender scalp. And of course, there was the flogging. Flogging or scourging was a very brutal whipping. Pastor Dave, Sorry. It was there. Pastor Dave was. Flogging or scourging was a very brutal whipping, so brutal that it sometimes caused death. The convicted person would be stripped and tied to a post by his wrists with his hands high enough over his head to virtually lift him off the ground. His feet would be dangling, and the skin on the back of his body would be completely taut. The whip that was used was made up of several strips of leather, which had been embedded with sharp pieces of metal, bone, and other sharp objects. 
The flesh of the prisoner would be cut to ribbons from the shoulders to the thighs, exposing the underlying muscles and other tissues to the same assault. It was not uncommon for the tears to cut deep into the kidneys. There was extreme shock involved and a large amount of blood loss. The prophet Isaiah, writing some 700 years before, says people were appalled at his condition. He was whipped and beaten beyond recognition as a man. In 52.14, he says, Just as there were many, of, many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness. All of this is the backdrop to where we pick up Jesus' passion tonight. And the worst is yet to come. Now we're going to begin in John chapter 19. Um, with Dick's help, we're going to have all of the verses on the screens behind me and over here. You're welcome to use your own versions if you want, but I'm going to warn you ahead of time. We'll be jumping back and forth between book and book quite often. You may want to just kind of relax and focus on the version on the screen. Uh, if any of you have handheld devices and you're looking it up, I'm teaching from the NIV 1984 edition. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to use parallel passages from all four of the Gospels. It's going to help us paint a fuller and more complete chronological picture of the crucifixion. It's a good Bible study practice. We have that information. Again, we can piece it all together and get a much fuller picture of everything that went on. Don't be alarmed that all four Bible, all four Gospels are not identical in their coverage. If we do a walkthrough event next year for the New Testament, we're going to learn that there's four distinct views, one good news. They all report the same thing, but as led by the Holy Spirit, they come at it from different angles. They have different people groups they're teaching, they're, they're presenting the gospel to, and it's just... Don't be alarmed. We're, we're going we're gonna to use all four of them. Don't be alarmed. There are no contradictions. And for whatever apparent differences may come up when you're comparing gospel account to gospel account, they can be explained. You just need to get enough information. We will be reminded throughout this event, again, that God is completely in control. This did not catch God off guard. This is the plan. It's not a good plan gone bad. This is the plan. Briefly, Mark 15, 25 says it was the third hour when they crucified him. So we're starting now at 9 o'clock in the morning on the day Christ was crucified. John 19, beginning at verse 16. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Now John indicates here as we read that Jesus is carrying his own cross. If we compare that to the other Gospels, we learn that because of his exhaustion and his total beatings that he had taken, he was unable to carry the top part of the cross all the way. He had to get help. Simon of Cyrene is enlisted. He carries it the rest of the way. But Jesus is in such a beaten condition, he couldn't make it all the way. In fact, the words seem to indicate that the soldiers had to help him walk along just to get there. Not only couldn't he carry it, but he could barely walk to make it to the this place of the skull. Uh, there's two debated areas outside of Jerusalem where they think Jesus was crucified. One of them is actually, there is a place, there's a hill in the background that is shaped remarkably like a skull. Could very well be where we're at here. The Bible never says, by the way, Jesus wasn't crucified on a hill. He was taken to a hill. And they would have crucified him down at ground level next to the road, next to the street, wherever it would be at, so the people walking by were close and could spit on him and yell at him and curse him and maybe throw things at him and so on. The, um, it's, it tells us here that Jesus is on a middle cross. Very likely, that was the cross that was set aside for Barabbas. You'll remember from the story, he was the one that was released, that uh, the Jewish leaders incited the crowds and said, give us Barabbas, 
crucify Jesus. So probably that was earmarked for Barabbas. Now, it's interesting that all four of the Gospels basically say they crucified him. And that's the only details they give. First century Palestine, through actually throughout the Roman Empire, crucifixion was very, very common. It would have been known by anybody there. They didn't need to have the details explained and included because they knew it was a fact of life and they knew how bad it was. For those of us that didn't live at that time, just a couple of points I'll share. Crucifixion was perhaps the most cruel and barbarous death known to man. It was practiced by many empires, but it was perfected by the Romans. Usually it was limited to the worst criminals and the lowest classes. It was designed to be as painful as humanly possible. As we've already seen, the convicted man was flogged. Then he was forced to carry his crossbeam. That would have been strapped to his injured back, creating additional pain and damage back there. Uh, it was done in a public place, so it was a very humiliating experience, not only on the path leading out to where you were going to be. You're walking right next to people, and they see you there. But again, it's done by a road, so people are right there to witness everything that goes on. And you just end up hanging there in front of them. Once you get out to the place where you're going to be crucified, they stripped you naked. The artwork we see of the crucifixion, probably out of respect for Jesus, don't, doesn't show that. But in reality, he would be hanging there totally naked. Then, as you know, they would nail the victim to the cross. And again, designed for tremendous pain. Uh, in, when the Bible refers to the hands, Jesus' hands and the marks in them and so on, the Greek word there is actually, it's not the middle of your palm, but it's the area from your palm down through your wrist. And what the practice was is the actual spike would go through the two bones in your forearm below the wrist because if they did it just through the hand, your body weight would tear through the hand and you wouldn't stay on the cross. Understand, too, that uh, crosses are probably shorter than what we imagine from the pictures we've seen and so on. Probably only five to six feet tall. And again, standing right there next to the street, it's easier to spit on somebody that's right there at eye level or a foot or so higher than if they're up away from you on a 10-foot cross or something like that. The pain from the flogging, and in Jesus' case, the beatings, pain from the cross beam being tied to your back, the pain from the nails cutting through um, nerve endings, severing nerves. I don't know if anybody here has ever hit their thumb with a, with a hammer, but you know how intensely painful that is. Just imagine that pain never giving up, just constantly being there because these nails are through. Your body felt pain from the abnormal hanging position. You know about the arms. We haven't talked about it yet, but the legs would be nailed to the cross as well. They would draw his legs up so knees were bent. Nail either through the ankles or through the arches of the feet. And what that did was it allowed you to raise yourself up. Death by crucifixion typically, not always, but typically was by asphyxiation. You suffocated. And the reason you suffocated is when you were hanging in that position, you could take air in, but you couldn't let it out. And eventually to let it out, you'd push yourself up on the spike that's through your ankles or your feet, allowed yourself to exhale, and then you would drop down again, and the whole process would start again over and over and over. The victim would experience a traumatic fever, dehydration, and intensive thirst. He would be exposed to the elements, the sun, the wind, and the bugs. The bugs would get into those open wounds, and there was nothing you could do about it. You had no defense. Matthew and Mark both tell us that Jesus was offered a wine mixed with gall or myrrh, and it was intended to deaden the pain. When he tasted it, it says he spit it out. He didn't want to take it. He was going to experience this torture fully for us. Our next verse here, we're going to look at Luke 23, 34. This is the first of seven recorded 
sayings of Jesus from the cross. Doesn't necessarily mean he didn't say other things, but this is all the Gospels tell us that he had said when he was on the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Again, his first saying, in the midst of his own tremendous suffering, here he is looking out for the well-being of the very people that were pounding the spikes into his arms and his feet. John 19, 19 continues the narrative. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Sign would be very typical part of crucifixion. Usually a soldier carried it in front of the condemned man as you went out to the place of crucifixion. Then it would be, just like they did here, mounted on your cross so the people walking by would see what the offense was, why he was being put to death. And of course it was all supposed to be a determent. I think that's the right word. Um, if you saw people being crucified, you certainly didn't want to break the law. We're going to see here in this next passage that we're, we're reminded again that the cross had always been God's plan. Again, this isn't catching him off guard. John 19, 23. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Way back in Psalm 22, 18 is where that comes from. So this is what the soldiers did. Jumping over to Mark's gospel in the 15th chapter, 29th verse. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now understand that Jesus remained on the cross not because he couldn't come down, but he wouldn't come down. You and I were on his mind when he was on the cross. He did this for us. And you know what? I would bet they didn't, wouldn't have even needed spikes to hold him there. I think his love for us would have held him in place. We're going to see here the conversion of a criminal. Uh, the last part of the verse we read, those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now the narrative continues. One criminal, uh, Matthew, Mark, I think call them robbers, but one of the criminals has a change of heart, literally. In Luke 23, verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now, no change in this man here. But note the other criminal's response. This is later on in the whole crucifixion event. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. And here's the second saying from the cross. And see the pattern? Jesus, in all of his agony, he's still taking care of the people around him. He's still looking out, and he's comforting them. We're going to see next in the narrative that Jesus makes provision for his mother's care. This is found in the 25th chapter of John. And John, I believe I'm correct in saying, I think he was the only disciple that hung around the cross. And he was part of this next thing here, and I'm pretty sure that's why the Holy Spirit had him include it. 
In John 25, we see that Jesus makes provision for his mother's care. Beginning in verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciples, this disciple took her into his home. This is Jesus' third saying on the cross. And think of what a tender moment that must have been. His mom is watching him go through the worst agony anybody ever could. And here he's looking out for her. And he, in essence, gives John the responsibility now to take her into his home, take care of her needs, and be her son, since her son Jesus is no longer going to be there. Now we start to see God orchestrating changes in the natural world. Over into Matthew 27, verse 45, we read, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. It was dark from noon to three o'clock. Imagine that. I think it's Luke that said the sun stopped shining. Now keep in mind again, we're, we're putting ourselves in that picture. You're outside. The day is normal weather-wise anyways. Somebody might have even glanced up just before noon and said, oh, it's just about midday. And then all of a sudden, the lights go out. That doesn't happen every day. In fact, I don't know if it's ever happened since. But what a, what a strange thing to be happening around this. There are indications, by the way, we won't go into them, but there are indications that this was a worldwide event because there's some writings from different areas that indicated this happened there as well. Okay, Jesus has been on the cross now for almost six hours. It's almost 3 o'clock, just a few minutes before. The rest of this whole narrative comes in rapid succession, one right after the other, and just a matter of a few minutes. It's almost 3 p.m. A lot happens in these last few minutes. Here's the fourth saying from the cross, Matthew 27, 46. About the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, why have you left me all alone? And it's almost as if God couldn't stand seeing the sin of everybody who's ever lived the entire world, and those who would live after this piled upon his son and him having to carry all of that weight. Or perhaps we know God is holy and he can't stand sin. Perhaps God just couldn't, couldn't watch because it was having him view sin in such an intense way. I don't really know, but the point is Jesus feels left all alone. He no longer has the comfort of the Father at this particular moment. Now, immediately followed, this is immediately followed, rather, by the fifth saying in John 19, 28. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, perhaps this is Psalm 69, 21, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. All part of the plan. Every step of this, much of it predicted in the Old Testament. Now, the writers keep referring to almost 3 o'clock. And we're going to hear in just a couple seconds here, at 3 o'clock. Here's how the writers knew what it... W here's how the writers knew that it was 3 o'clock. At 3 o'clock every day, a sacrifice was offered for the nation. There was a priest who, was, who would make his way to the top of the structure, probably on one of the highest corners. He would take a ram's horn or a shofar with him. And somebody down below would be watching the sundial. And at exactly 3 o'clock, he would indicate to the priest up at the top, the high peak of the temple, that it was time. 
and the priest would blow his shofar or his trumpet exactly at 3 p.m. Now get this. The religious within hearing distance would pause knowing that a sacrifice was being made on their behalf exactly at that time. I'll come back to the story at the cross. At exactly 3 p.m., a ram's horn sounds indicating the sacrifice for the nation is taking place. There is this pause, and right at this moment, Jesus declares his sixth and seventh sayings from the cross. John 19.30, the first part. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. It is finished. As Pastor Dave said earlier tonight, meaning paid in full, as to a debt. We'll talk more about this in a moment. Then immediately, that, that saying is followed by his seventh and final recorded saying from the cross. Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. John adds, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now again, get that. There was this pause. The Jews come to a standstill, reflecting on the sacrifice being made in the temple at that exact moment. And Jesus' words very likely could be one right after the other. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then when he had said that, he breathed his last. This is not a typical ending to a crucifixion. Jesus is in total control here. He died at the exact minute he wanted to, when the daily sacrifice for the whole nation was being killed, and at exactly the same time that all the Passover lambs began to be slaughtered. Our Passover lamb had paid the debt in full. His final words said with a loud voice, were a declaration of victory. Now, Jesus' death is obviously the climax of the crucifixion account. But before we talk more of its significance, I want to show you just a few more events. Here we see more responses in the natural world to the crucifixion and some spiritual responses as well. In Matthew 27, 51, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. All of this happened at exactly the precise moment Jesus died. And again, try to imagine that scene. It's almost as if the earth was suffering with him. Now, with regard to the temple, the, the curtain, the veil in the temple being torn in two from top to bottom, Josephus tells us that that curtain was a beautiful creation, a beautiful curtain. He said it was as thick as a man's hand. Now, not this way. Not like the three-quarters of an inch, but this way. It was three to four inches thick, and it was some 60 to 90 feet tall. It was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the most holy place inside the main part of the temple. Now, you know what it's like when you take an old T-shirt and you rip it to make a rag out of it or something like that. Imagine the sound of this huge, I don't know what to call it, but this huge woven thing being torn. It had to be a tremendous noise. And it points out, too, it was torn from top to bottom. There was nothing going on where anybody in the bottom were, were starting this thing. It started way up there, 60, 90 feet in the air, and it tore itself. Well, God had it torn somehow. The significance is twofold. The obvious one we think of and we've heard about is that now... God, who stayed in the Holy of Holies behind this curtain in the temple, was now accessible by us. We no longer had to go through the priests. 
we no longer had to go through the whole sacrificial system with all the killing of the lambs and goats and everything else. We had direct access to God. But when we look at this from the Hebrew perspective, the Jewish perspective, there's another dimension there. They would see this and understand it also, in addition to that, is that now God is coming out of the temple. And now he's going to dwell in the new temples that believers have. And this took place some 50 days later at Pentecost. So there's, there's a great significance in that. Um, the last verse, last part of the, uh, the description we're going to cover, Matthew 27, 54. Look at the response now of these hardened soldiers, the centurion and probably four soldiers with him on the crucifixion detail. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Now this centurion and these guards were expert executioners. And they realized this was not a typical crucifixion event and it wasn't a crucifixion it wasn't a typical crucifixion death as well they recognized jesus as the son of god a normal victim would eventually expire little by little by little until he would just kind of pass along jesus's death was controlled and they could see that yes he was beaten yes he was exhausted yes he was weakened but he closed up his ministry here on earth with a loud, victorious voice. Again, exactly as he wanted to do it. And then you're there on this guard detail, and as soon as he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, an earthquake happens, and rocks break apart, and tombs break open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. This is a phenomenal event. Okay. I have to say this too. I'm sorry. It, it, it amazes me that here the centurion and the guards did come to recognize and accept Jesus as the Son of God, but the Jewish nation stubbornly refused to accept him. And they had been exposed to so much more of his teaching and so many of his miracles. Even this, there were a lot of them right there, even this, they fought it. Now that we have looked intently at the crucifixion and the events surrounding it, we need to determine its significance. And some of this has already been reflected in the songs we've sung and some of the comments Chris was making and Pastor Dave. It is profound but at the same time, it is understandable. Let's go back to Jesus' words, it is finished. It is finished has the meaning of a debt being paid in full. With Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross, God's plan for dealing with the sin of mankind was completed. Our debt, the cost of our sin, was paid by the only one who could ever pay it. 1 John 2, 2 says he, meaning Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. The phrase atoning sacrifice, or some of your Bibles would have it propitiation, according to John MacArthur, quote, speaks of an offering made to satisfy God. Christ's death was a satisfaction rendered to God on behalf of those whom he redeemed. Unquote. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Quoting again from John MacArthur, Jesus was made sin on our behalf. He remained sinless on the cross. He was guilty of nothing. God treated Jesus as if he had committed personally ever, every sin ever committed by every person who would believe. Jesus needed to live a perfect life to fulfill all righteousness, and he did so for some 33 years. We are not righteous, 
But God treats us as if we are. On the cross, Jesus wasn't a sinner. But God treated him as if he was. On the cross, God treated Jesus as if he had lived our life so that he could treat us as if we have lived Jesus' life. That's imputation and substitution. Jesus came to exchange his life for yours in order to fulfill God's plan for salvation. Unquote. You'll remember what John the baptizer said when he saw Jesus walking toward him. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And finally, Hebrews 10.10, 10, And by that will, the Father's will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It is finished. It's as if God took a huge hand stamp that only he had a right to use, dipped it in the red blood puddled at the foot of Jesus' cross, and stamped on the top of the cross above Jesus' head, paid in full. And if we have placed our belief and trust in the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross for salvation, the cross is our receipt. The crucifixion account is an incredible reminder of the cost of sin and the love that Jesus has for us. What is the cost of sin? In Jesus' case, it cost him everything. Not for anything he ever did, but because of what we have done. Don't ever doubt his love for you. Growing up as a little guy, my grandmother would get me to ask her, Grandma, how much do you love me? This much, she would say, and spread her arms just as wide as she possibly could. Louise gave me a little card some years ago that says, I asked Jesus, how much do you love me? This much, he answered, and he stretched out his arms and died. Would you bow your heads with me, please? To be totally transparent with you, I'm not exactly sure how I'm supposed to close now. I've been praying for God's guidance, and I'm just going to try and follow what, where he leads. Pastor Dave has been speaking the last couple times he's preached, and he's asked, who do we say Jesus is? Of course, in response to when Jesus was asking his disciples, who are the people saying that he is? So let me start there. For those of us here in this room right here tonight, who do you say Jesus is? If you're a believer, and what I mean by that is if at some time in your past, you have understood enough of the gospel message. You've understood that because of Adam and Eve's sin, sin came into the entire world and every person that's ever lived. And you understand that that sin separates you from God because God is holy and he can't tolerate sin. And if you recognize that there's nothing you can do about it on your own. And you need a Savior. You need someone who God says is an acceptable sacrifice and that can pay the cost of your sin. And if you understand that Jesus came and lived a perfectly sinless life while he was here, 
And if you understand that through his shed blood on the cross, God required the shedding of blood, and he offered his freely on our behalf. If you believe that his blood is acceptable to God and will pay in full your debt because of your sin, and if you at some point have confessed these truths to Jesus and ask him into your heart, then I guess I hope tonight's teaching would help you fully appreciate, or more fully appreciate anyways, the sacrifice he's made. That when you come here to worship, or you worship him in your normal day, that when you commune with him, that when you pray to him, you would keep that at the forefront of your mind and that you would genuinely show him the thankfulness you have for all he's done. But if there's anybody here tonight that maybe hasn't gone that far, perhaps you're like the Jewish nation where you've been exposed to the teachings before. You've, you've heard the story. You've heard enough of it to know what's required. But you still have stubbornly refused to acknowledge him as Lord and to ask him to take over your life and to provide the forgiveness you need. What are you waiting for? We will not get a second opportunity after death to place our faith in Christ in a way that would allow us to spend eternity with him in heaven. We have to do it before we leave here. And we never know when we're going to go. There's 150-some people that were at a university over in Africa, I think it was just yesterday, that got up for a normal day and went to school, not knowing that it was going to be their last day here on earth. We just don't know, folks. So I guess I would ask you to consider where you're at. I guess I would ask that as you go from here tonight, again, it's with a renewed appreciation for what Christ has done, but if you're not sure, if you're not sure where you stand and whether you're ready to face eternity, whether you're ready to stand before a holy God and to be able to answer why it is he should allow you to stay in heaven with him, I would encourage you to stay after tonight. I would welcome a chance to talk with you. Pastor Dave is right up here at the front, I know. I know he would be glad to talk to you as well. Perhaps in the, the spirit of what we've talked about tonight, maybe we could leave here in, in silence tonight. Maybe out of honor and appreciation for what he did. Maybe we could keep the time now between him and us. So again, I would invite you to come forward. If you have any doubts at all about where you stand spiritually, whether you're truly saved or not, please come up quietly and privately. We can talk with you here. And for everyone else, if I could just ask you to leave the sanctuary in silence. Father God, we, we praise you. We praise you for your plan of salvation. We praise you that you loved us enough to make a way for us to be saved from our sins. Lord Jesus, what can we say? We can't even begin to uh, fully, 
feel what it was you went through on our behalf. But Lord, for all of us here, may I say thank you. May we praise you that you did love us so much that you went through that whole ordeal. Never once did you turn aside. You didn't even take the, the wine with the gall in it to ease some of the pain, but you did it all for us. So, Lord, be with us as we leave here tonight. Help us to keep that sense of appreciation. Help us to serve you in a way that reflects that thankfulness that we have. It is in your name, Jesus, the Lamb of God who's taken away all of our sins that we pray.